Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Futures Frame TV. I'm Elise Crozer, your host on the Inequalities sure. Channel. And I am here today with Amalia Polido, who is an expert in uh, political violence and uh, its relation to elections and to political parties. Amalia is an assistant professor at the Political Studies Department of the Center for Research and Teaching in Economics, the CIDE, in Mexico City. Amalia, welcome to the program. Hello, Alice. Thank you so much for this invitation. I'm really glad to be here and to spend some minutes talking about my research and other stuff. Yeah, thank you for being here with us. I mean, your topic is uh, clearly very important these days. I mean, any days, but these days there's a lot of talk about elections, about uh, possible relations to violence, where it comes about. Can you talk a little bit about a study that you uh, did a couple of years back in recently? <laughs> on the relationship between elections and campaign promises mm -hmm. and how this plays out? Well, so um, as you already mentioned, my, my research agenda focuses on the relationship between political violence and elections and political parties in Mexico and also in Latin America, but I specifically study Mexico. As, as you mentioned also, this is a really relevant topic, especially for the times we're living in Mexico. We just had elections uh, two days ago in Coahuila and Hidalgo, and we will have the biggest electoral process in 2021, when we will uh, elect governors, majors, local and federal deputies. So I think this topic, unfortunately, it's, it's really relevant, right? Because in Mexico, as in other countries, we are living a crisis in terms of how criminal organizations affect the um, decisions in politics, also how they can shape not just the selection of candidates, but also the implementation of public policies. So I think that's my main area. And as, as you already mentioned, I'm working on a project related to promise a campaign promise in Mexico, electoral accountability, and basically with two other colleagues, uh, Horacio Larregui and John Marshall, we are collecting information about all the promises that majors made in the past electoral process in 2018, and we are interested in know how they implement these promises once they are in power. So specifically how they are spending the budget related on, on, on what they promised in the past. So I think this is a really interesting question because in Mexico, accountability and linkage between citizens and politicians are very weak and we are like a young democracy. And this is also, we can see that also in terms of accountability. So in this project, we are looking at these promises and how they spend the budget and also how these have implications for future electoral performance. So basically the, the expectation is that if you promise something and then you didn't do anything about that promise, you will have some electoral cost, right? Or reputational cost in the future. So that's that's one of the, of the main projects. And the other one is specifically how criminal organizations capture political processes, especially the selection of candidates. As you know, and maybe most of the of your audience should know, in Mexico we have a strong presence of specific type of violent non-state actor, that is criminal organizations. And these organizations, they not just only kill uh, politicians, but that they also look for other ways to influence politics. And one of that ways is cooperation dynamics, right? So basically they make some uh, negotiations or, or they can make some pressure on their party leaders to influence the selection candidate process. And do they also uh, postulate their own candidates or how, how do we imagine that in practice, how their influence? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because we have very poor data to study this. I mean, this is a, I don't want to, to say a dangerous topic, but it's kind of because Probably you is. have to have information and do research about the connections that candidates have. And sometimes we can see that they actually select the candidate. Or sometimes once the candidate is selected by the party, they do some kind of connection or they reach the candidate out to say, if you don't cooperate, you will face the consequences, right? That it can be, they can kill the candidate. I mean, we saw that in the 2018 electoral process, right? We have more than 60 candidates killed by these type of organizations. Six and zero. so, I so, mean, this is... 
60. Yeah, 60. Uh -huh. 60. Yeah, it, it was like more than 54. I mean, I don't have the uh, precise number, but it was like a, a very large number in terms of uh, assassinations. So this is a, a real problem. Um, it's also, a real, I mean, of course, this is a, a major and a very severe problem, but there's also maybe one level back uh, when politicians come to be on the payroll of these organizations, right? And then they're accountable to these uh, organizations. And uh, we recently had a very resounding case with the former secretary of the Marine or of the Army in Mexico that uh, turns out to have been on the payroll of these organizations. What do we do with such a case? <laughs> What do we make of this? Yeah, I mean, this is a, an issue that doesn't distinguish between levels of government, right? As you mentioned, this was in the upper level of government. It was in the federal and the national. And, and we can see the closest circle to the president. And he was cooperating with criminal organizations, right? And we're talking about the federal government where, where we have... We can see like they are more in the spotlight than, I don't know, like local major or local candidate in the Guerrero Sierra, for example, right? So so we can we can see that this is like a real problem, especially in the local level, because the information is poor. They don't have protection as they can have in other levels of government. Criminal organizations are penetrating local levels, especially because they can operate and they can manage their activities at this level. So I, I think also there's a... a There's politics, of course, right, uh, involved in this, in this situation. In the past, and we can say in the dominant party regime, these relationships were established at the upper level. Like the criminal organizations just need to make these cooperation schemes with the federal government. But in the times we're living with more democracy, alternation in power, like these dynamics needs to also be uh, implemented at the local level. So this is why the local level is really important. And sadly, also killing a politician at the local level, I mean, it's less costly than killing someone at the upper levels. I think this is a really important question. We also see the attack against the Secretary of Security in Mexico City like three or four months ago. So these organizations, like they are really willing to take the risk and to grow their business. I mean, they are economic actors with a rational approach and what they want is to keep their business and to grow that business and also to eliminate the rivals right so they will uh, use all the means that they have to seek these objectives there's maybe a common misperception right of these groups as some gangs or some uh, low-level uh, bandits that run around with their guns shooting in the air i mean these are proper businesses and large uh, international organizations and they have business going into all kind of uh, other countries and in all kind of different business areas and clearly the, the the main difference is that they're willing to take other means right to accomplish their business goals and some of them probably because there's less scrutiny at the local level is easier to conduct politics at the local level maybe also the influence they can have on the local level is bigger. Yes, exactly. The influence at the local level is, is, is bigger. And here we can talk a little bit about violence and how these organizations operate in these levels. I think one of the saddest parts of, of this presence of criminal organizations in Mexico is the children recruitment, for example. We are seeing that these criminal organizations recruit poor people, people without opportunities, Uh, children from these uh, marginalized areas to join the organizations, to grow the organizations, and to help in, in, in this um, in this situation, right? So, so I think the especially the the municipalities and and regions, as as I already mentioned, not just in the Sierra of Guerrero, but also other states, we have a huge problem in how. Uh, criminal organizations can use this opportunity, the, the opportunities that governments don't implement public policies related to these vulnerable uh, populations, and then they can like substitute the state in some in some ways, right? So I think it's, this is also a problem that we need to do more more research on and to to see what, how to stop these dynamics. So the, what you're saying is that they are implementing some kind of parallel, let's call it welfare structure, right? Basic services uh, to communities that are disconnected from public services. Exactly. And uh, in the criminal governance literature, uh, there is a lot of works that study this, how criminal organizations implement these governments, right? These criminal 
government structures where they actually provide with goods, provide with services to the population. And we also see this in the in the pandemic in Mexico, for example, in Guanajuato, it was like a, like well sound in the in the media that the Jalisco Nueva Generación organization uh, gave food and other goods to people in these marginalized regions of the state. So basically they can substitute the state in some in some instances, right? So this is a, a huge problem because they can be legitimized with people who are being benefited by, by, by criminal organizations, actually. How does it relate to uh, what you were saying before, uh, the promises that candidates make? Uh, I mean, so if politicians make promises, campaign promises, and then they are held accountable by their uh, constituencies or by these criminal organizations or by their parties, or how, how do they go around this, this triangle? I would like to have an answer for that question because it's like, really hard to know what is going on there. As you said, we don't really know who is the constituency. Is the constituency the citizens? Is the constituency the criminal organizations? Or who they are working for? Because we know that in campaigns, politicians make thousands of promises. It's, it's what we see not just in Mexico, but all around the world. And it's really hard to make that promises, I mean, to implement that policies in the in the future, right? So we don't know. Maybe they are accountable to criminal organizations. As I already mentioned, the criminal governance literature had studied this issue or this, this effect on how criminal organizations actually get access to taxes or to governmental policies. So... That's uh, of the issues here, right? Uh, in some regions, in some regions, we can say that criminal organizations actually respond to other interests, but not the citizens, right? So how can we improve the conditions of people of society when they are responding not to the citizens or the public uh, good, but to criminal organizations? How does your experience here compare to uh, experience that you also have uh, in other countries? I know that you've been an electoral observer in Guatemala uh, some time back. Uh, how do you think um, these two places compare? So I think it's it's really similar in terms of how these organizations are involved in politics. Fortunately, in Guatemala, they are also suffering a lot of presence of local criminal organizations, but also Mexican criminal organizations, because Guatemala... It has a strategic geographical location. So basically the country is really important in terms of trafficking drugs and, and other illicit substances. So in the past electoral process where I was um, an electoral observer, yeah, we saw the same, right? Like candidates who were attacked or who, who have some intimidations from these organizations. So I think in the region, we are living a generalized problem. And there, there were some municipalities, especially in the border in Guatemala, with a strong presence of Sinaloa cartel, for example, right? And also we saw a lot of inequalities in, in this part of the, of the country, a lot of clientelism, because that's also important to say. I think uh, when we talk about elections, we cannot forget to mention the, the strong relationship between clientelism and inequalities, right? That is an opportunity for any politician who wants to win, right? And if that politician also has the support, the, the, the economic support from criminal organizations. It's like a formula that cannot fail, right? So, so Not that's, particularly that's democratic. An issue. Not democratic at all, but I mean, successful in terms of elections. <laughs> How do these uh, dynamics relate to, to broader inequalities? Do you think there is a link between this uh, political capture, let's call it, uh, and uh, inequalities that we see in the region. We can see the, the relationship in terms that politicians don't respond to citizens. They are not accountable to citizens. And that's I think that's one of the first signals that we can identify uh, in this inequalities speech, right? Because they are not working to improve their constituency lives and their opportunities, then what can we expect, right? We will still seeing these kind of dynamics over and over again. So I think that's one of the main issues that we can identify. And also how inequalities play in this political game in terms of clientelism, as I already mentioned. You cannot have clientelar relations in regions that are not marginalized, right? So that's one of really important features when we study these type of problems. And also 
criminal governance schemes will be or will increase the likelihood of having this type of regimes in regions where the state is absent or where governments are not implementing or not are not working to favor the vulnerable populations, right? As I already mentioned, in the case of uh, the children recruitment for these organizations, I mean, they have the opportunities to recruit children and to recruit other young males, right? Because uh, unfortunately, they are the main workforce for criminal organizations. And the inequalities make all these uh, dynamics possible in, in the way that People are marginalized, people are vulnerable, we have an absent state, government are not implementing policies to improve people's lives. So I think inequalities have a really important role in all this complex situation that we live, not just in Mexico, but in the region in general. Um, Yeah, you say this is a very complex situation and obviously then no uh, simple answer, I expect, uh, to resolve this problem. Uh, But could you tell us a little bit about what could be done to improve the situation? One of the of the first suggestions that that we can identify is to uh, make politicians accountable. And I think, for example, this exercise of having a data with the promises and how they implement the budget. I think that's a, a good start. But also we need more informed citizens because information is power, right? Uh, unfortunately, some citizens don't have access to, I don't know, the means to ask politicians how they are spending the money or how they are doing. One step is to have better informed citizens. I think that's one of the of the first suggestions or strategies. The other one is that we really need to watch the political candidate selection. And once they are in power, I think we need to follow what they are doing in terms of of government and the relations they have. I did my dissertation on this. And when I asked political party candidates and party leaders, like, well, how do you deal with this? Or what if you know that one of your candidates is in collusion with criminal organizations? The most common answer that I have, and not just in one party, but in in everyone, is that we are not intelligence agencies and we are not in charge of public security. So basically, we don't care, right? If they have connections or if they are in collusion, it's not our business, right? It's other business. So I think we also need to have politicians that take responsibility for for this issue and also to follow them, in, especially in the electoral processes. In 2021, we will have one of the biggest elections in Mexico, and we really need to follow the political selection, how the candidates uh, develop their, their campaign. So I think that's a really, really important thing that we need to do. And also one of the biggest problems in, Mexi- in Mexico is impunity, as you already, I mean, you, you should know, right? As long as in Mexico we have these levels of impunity, we will still having these, these problems. Yeah, and there seems to be another curious occurrence with these candidates that are not held accountable or where there's no scrutiny or where there's no uh, intelligence uh, looking over them. A couple of years ago, I remember there was a case in uh, Veracruz uh, with the so-called Candidato Morris, uh, which was uh, the, the candy cat, uh, not the candidate, but the, the, the cat that postulated as mayor of uh, Veracruz, of, of Jalapa, I don't remember, one of the cities in, in Veracruz. And apparently there are several fake candidates. I mean, not only cats that postulate as mayors, but uh, which, by the way, this cat got the third most votes in the election. So it was uh, wow. a pretty successful cat. Um, but apparently there's also other fake candidates, right? And probably you can expect that some might work with uh, organized crime or other. What I have like identified in my research is, is that if a candidate has a, a clear connection with organized crime, the likelihood that they will win the elections increase. So that's also a problem, right? Because it's not it's not just that they got selected by the party or they are working during the campaign with organized crime, but the likelihood that they actually win, uh, it's really high. So this collusion scheme doesn't end with the election. It's something that that follows in the in the next years, right? And once they are in power, uh, I mean, they will have the organized crime behind them and telling them how to do their their government. Do you think the current situation of the pandemic has a specific influence or does it change the dynamics? I think the pandemic was an excellent opportunity to organize crime, to, to have more right. presence in some of the regions, yeah, and to legitimize their own organizations. We know that in several regions of the country, people actually support defend and sometimes hide the criminal organization leaders. 
because they are really thankful to, to these organizations, right? So we see, we saw a lot of these organizations giving dispensas or, I mean, food to, to the people. And they, I mean, it was like in the media, like they were with a huge trucks full of food and giving it to the people, I mean, in the daily life, right? So it was not, not I mean, it was something that, that, that it was public, is public available. So I think these situations uh, increase the popularity of, of criminal organizations in some regions. And this can also have direct effects in the, in the, in the coming election because they are increasing the community support. Well, I mean, it's uh, certainly a very pessimistic scenario, at least for us, maybe not so much for the criminal organizations themselves. Uh, I guess they're prospering uh, as ever. But uh, is there something that, that gives you hope in this situation so that we don't end on such a negative note? I mean, one positive thing is that this type of situations and these kind of things that are happening all the, all the time, I mean, at least we have information in the media. So I think that's a possible, a positive thing, right? In the past, it was everything in the shadow. And I mean, we knew that there was some collusion or some direct relationships between politicians and government organizations. But I think we are living a time where there's more information and that's, that's something positive. People are more informed. I mean, we want them to be more, I mean, even more informed, but uh, we have very informed people. Social media is playing a really important role. Twitter, Facebook, I mean, these, these type of platforms have information for people and it's easier to get access to this type of... So I think that's positive because we can... We know what is going on, right? So I think that's that's a good thing. And I would like to be more positive, but I think the coming electoral process in Mexico will be pretty bad in terms of uh, assassinations and intimidations against candidates. I mean, at least in uh, from June to today, October... 15, I mean, the first uh, 15 days of October, I have uh, a list of 24 political assassinations in the country. So, and, and it's not, I mean, we are not in the electoral process. Well, we were in the in Coahuila and Hidalgo, but we are not in the national electoral process. So I think this will get worse in the in the coming months. And I would like to be more positive, but I'm I'm worried I'm, I'm, I'm not able to, to, to give you a better diagnostic about this. Uh, no, I mean, at least uh, I guess the, the positive aspect for us, the rest is that you're looking into this data. And now maybe with the social media, as you say, uh, there is more information. Also, politicians will have to be more, be able to be held more accountable with all the statements they make and all the tweeting that's going on. And uh, I mean, I know that you're uh, studying exactly these dynamics of uh, comments on Twitter uh, by politicians and how they're uh, enacted or not. So uh, I guess we're at least helpful, uh, thankful, uh, hopeful uh, that, uh, that you're investigating these processes. Amalia, before we close, is there anything you would like to add, uh, something that uh, we haven't been saying that is incredibly important in relation to this uh, topic for everybody to know? Well, we, we talk a lot about what I'm doing in my research. I think there's a lot of questions that we need to start I investigating. As I already mentioned, there's a, a clear relationship between having these connections and the likelihood of winning the election. But I think we need further research to understand the causal mechanism in this kind of questions. And, and also, I think there are like a lot of areas uh, when we study criminal governance and uh, criminal organizations and the rela relationship with the state that we have to do more research on. And one of the areas that I'm interested in is how women involved in these organizations because we have the or, or we make the assumption that they are the lovers or, the, or they cook for the criminal leaders. But what we are seeing right now, it's like an upper level involvement of, of women. And I'm wondering how these relationships are growing inside the criminal organization. So I think that's a really interesting question that I would love to see some research on. And um, we have a lot of uh, areas to study. And I, I think we need more data. Unfortunately, data access is a huge caveat because we, I mean, you need to create your own data. We have data on homicides or assassinations but when we study like uh, the involvement of organizations with politicians like we don't have data right I, I wonder that's the same when we study the structure uh, of criminal organizations you can do some qualitative work or research but also it's really dangerous to, to study these type of questions so I think as researchers we have to figure out ways to study this yeah I really hope you figure it out and you continue with your 
uh, really interesting uh, studies uh, for all of us. It would be really interesting to know more about the women involved in the uh, upper echelons uh, of organized crime. Maybe there is something to a new uh, gender dynamics uh, in this area as well. And uh, anyways, in all kinds of aspects related to election accountability, politicians accountability, and hopefully the decrease of political violence in the region and beyond. Um, Amalia, thank you so much for telling us about these interesting Uh, studies and your work on these topics and uh, we hope to see future studies about the new questions that you're carrying on with yourself great thank you alice uh, thank you for uh, watching this episode and if you like these topics if you want to know more about inequalities please join us again next saturday for another episode of futures frame tv i'm alice crozer your host on the inequalities channel have a good afternoon and hope to see you soon bye bye <laughs>